Okay, uh, so you should have a handout, and uh, I'm grateful. I want to thank first uh, Donka and Michael for inviting me. I want to thank John McCarthy for um, saying why it was okay to have a handout, not as just technical incompetence, but actually historical tribute. And um, I also have to thank um, all of the AV people who have uh, helped me set up an extremely primitive little presentation that's about to happen. Um, um, and most of all, of course, I want to thank uh, Morris Halley, not only for living so um, uh, long and fruitfully, but <laughs> that we get to have provided the occasion for today, but also um, specifically for bringing ideas together that founded the field that I work in. Um, whoops, sorry. Um, so, and since the occasion is a somewhat personal one, I want to take up a somewhat uh, personal topic, though mindful of what uh, Francois said, Morris said last night, that an autobiography is not an argument. Um, <laughs> um, the topic is English anapests, and uh, they raise a question that I proposed to write my dissertation on that I felt that I never um, solved there. I answered a different <laughs> question instead. And um, uh, what I want to do here is to revisit that question. Um, and I should... Um, okay, so to start, to the, by anapests I mean uh, the rising triple meter with uh, stress on every third syllable that you see in... Um, Example one on your handout from a famous poem by Byron, uh, which figures from the get-go in Fab and Halley's um, Meter in Poetry, A New Theory. Uh, the Assyrian came down like the wolf on the fold, and his cohorts were gleaming in purple and gold, and the sheen of their spears was like stars on the sea when the blue ray wave rolls nightly on deep Galilee. And so on. I've been unable to restrain myself from giving full poems on the handout, but I won't read them all. Um, so, the question that anapests raise for meter is roughly why they should exist at all. Um, although that question is really an artifact of theoretical assumptions about both phonology and the relationship between phonology and poetry. Um, it's generally assumed in uh, metrics within the tradition whose lineage is being celebrated here that meter is grounded in phonological uh, competence. And, um, but depending on your assumptions about phonology, it may or may not make triple rhythms available as some kind of a, a primitive. Um, and um, the deeper question that anapests raise is really um, why that question should be so theoretically vexing when triple meters, or sorry, triple rhythms occur very freely in music and in dance and in other domains of rhythmic experience. So um, um, what, I, that is, what I want to do is actually um, uh, revisit them from a perspective um, that brings those ideas from the psychology of rhythm in a little bit. Um, so I'll begin by just unpacking the questions that anapests raise um, a little bit more thoroughly. Um, when I was in the ninth inning of my PhD in linguistics and still without a really good topic to work on because um, I wasn't that interested in all of the things in syntax and pragmatics that seemed like the kind of natural place for a combination of literature and, and linguistics. Paul Kaparsky taught a course on meter and it's the only course that I have a sort of photographic image of the syllabus for because it started with something that said two classics and it was Jesperson's notes on meter and um, uh, Halley and Kaiser's 1966 Chaucer in the Study of Prosody. And that, of course, laid out the assumption that uh, meter was knowledge of the same basic type as uh, knowledge of a grammar. And uh, Paul wrote an article in the same year as that course um, which really made quite explicit the, assum the assumption that um, on the one hand, uh, Jacques, that, that generalized the relevant ideas to poetic forms in general, taking Jacobson's idea that poetic forms involve iteration of structures and um, putting that together with the idea that 
uh, what structures were linguistically available were given by universal grammar to have a specific theory of poetic forms as iterating structures given by universal grammar. And in that year, in 1987, triple meters provided, raised a prima facie exception to that because um, the triple, the entry on your handout in two is just the very standard um, typology of traditional English meters that has classifies them as rising or falling in duple or triple. Um, but at that moment in phonology, the primitive status of um, any kinds of ternary structures was being um, questioned. Um, and I won't go through that uh, here particularly. Uh, there was Hayes's dissertation that showed that it was an unnecessary assumption for English to have iterating ternary uh, feet. And um, the basic insight still remains in many uh, theories of phonology with things like foot binarity as a basic um, structure. And um, the outstanding exception remains, which is a little bit parallel to the um, poetic example I'll talk about, is, is Kayuvapa, which just sat there as a reproach to a completely thorough rejection of the um, possibility of primitive uh, ternary structures. Uh, so it's a problem that didn't quite go away in, in linguistics. Um, at the same time, there was evidence for the binary structure of anapests themselves in English. Um, uh, Paul's article in 1975 had already pointed um, out that you could have in anapests like in four, uh, uh, lexical stress in the first but not the second of the two weak syllables in an anapestic foot. So you had lines like, oh say can you see by the dawn's early light, where early is the weak part, light is the strong part, but you couldn't have had immense in that position. So um, his 1977 article, uh, posited the basic form in 4b for the anapest um, of having a, it's a binary foot, a weak position and a strong position, but the weak position is split into a strong element and a weak element. And that meant that that terminal weak, it was the only one that rejected a syllable that was stressed relative to another one in the same word. So two rules govern stress in, or the, the basic picture of anapests then is that that's the template, they require a syllable in each position. The strong, the, the, the unsubordinated strong position must have a stress syllable in it, and that little weak, subordinate weak position can't have a lexical stress in it. Uh, this, lexical stress of a polysyllabic word. Um, so that's the basic um, picture of anapests, and I just should say that that generalization about what the weak position can't contain is the same, weak, uh, the same generalization that governs stress throughout the entire iambic uh, tradition in English. It's a prohibition on a syllable which is strong relative to another one in the same lexical word being in the weak position, and that's just what the examples uh, D through E are showing. Okay, um, so, and I just want to confirm this, um, the strength of the, all of these generalizations have just stood the test for time. Decades of reading English poetry have unearthed only one significant counterexample to um, that generalization in 4a, and that is in 5 from the great poet of anapests in English, Dr. Seuss. Um, it's from Horton Hatches the Egg. And um, I'll just read this one. Um, and she swooped from the clouds through an open tent door. Oh, if you know the story, I'm sorry, is Maisie the Lazy Bird has um, uh, got an egg and she's bored sitting on her egg, so she talks Horton the elephant into sitting on her egg for her while she f flies off to vacation in Palm Beach. And um, Horton endures all kinds of trials and tribulations through which he says, I, I said what I meant and I meant what I said in Elephant's Faithful 100%. And finally he arrives with a circus that he's been captured into, into Palm Beach. And um, in the shock of the confrontation, the egg hatches, and that's the passage. Uh, the she here is Maisie. And she swooped from the clouds through an open front door. Good gracious, gasped Maisie, I've seen you before. 
Poor Horton looked up with his face white as chalk. He started to speak, but before he could talk, there rang out the noisiest ear-splitting squeaks from the egg that he'd sat on for 51 weeks. A thumping, a bumping, a wild, alive scratching. My egg, shouted Horton, my egg, while it, why, it's hatching. But it's mine, screamed the bird when she heard the egg crack. The work was all done. Now she wanted it back. It's my egg, she sputtered. You stole it from me. Get off of my nest and get out of my tree. Poor Horton backed down with a sad, heavy heart. But at that very instant, the egg burst apart, and out of the pieces of red and white shell from the egg that he'd sat on so long and so well, Horton the elephant saw something whiz. It had ears and a tail and a trunk just like his. So that's the illustration I couldn't resist showing you. And the relevant line is the position of the word alive in 5b, a thumping, a bumping, a wild, alive scratching, which is contrary to the generalization. But it's a beautiful example of the meter being used to, um, in, to express the contrary to nature phenomenon of the elephant bird. OK, so the point is just that the empirical generalizations about anapests um, have held up very well, and they were theorized by Prince, as shown in um, 6, um, with the idea that what that pattern arises from is the idea of splitting a beat within the meter so that there is always a, uh, and, and he claims that as in music, when you split a beat and it has an internal trochaic structure, that explains why you get triple feet in poetry of the structures shown in six, um, but not, other, not ones in which the beat would be ever split with an iambic subpart. OK, so, um, so that's kind of what was known <laughs> at that um, point where I started working on the question of how do we reconcile the existence of these uh, anapests in English poetry with the um, problem of their exclusion from phonological theory, which was not an undebated point. Um, so I turned to Sainsbury's History of English Prosody to get a sense of uh, where to begin. And he celebrated uh, Tennyson as the great writer of anapests in English. And um, in seven, you have um, an example of an anapestic poem written by uh, Tennyson. Just look at the beginning of it. Thou land of the lily, thy gay flowers are blooming. Enjoy on thine hills, but they bloom not for me. For a dark gulf of woe, all my fond hopes entombing had rolled its black wave twixt this lone heart and thee. And it goes on. Now, um, this poem, however, is not really, um, it's, it's, it's not what Sainsbury had in mind uh, when he talked about Tennyson's splendid anapests. It comes from a collection of about um, seven or eight anapestic poems that were written in uh, Tennyson's first book, Poems by Two Brothers, written between when he was 14 and 17, um, together with his older brother. They, it was kind of his juvenilia, and he insisted that he didn't want it ever published again. Um, the poems that um, Sainsbury had in mind are represented more in eight on your handout. Um, and they, what they have as a characteristic is that they mix binary and ternary rhythms um, in, 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 a, in a way which is actually the way the English language does. So um, just a little bit of it, this poem, The Voyage of Muldoon, and we came to the silent isle that we never had touched at before where a silent ocean always broke on a silent shore. And the brooks glittered on in the light without sound, and the long waterfall poured in a thunderless plunge to the base of the mountain wall, and it goes on. So um, just the, the quick um, uh, f fact about this is that um, the variable syllable count that it shows is really um, the crucial thing here. It had a pattern of either one or two unstressed syllables in a weak position. Um, it um, could have a single monosyllabic word stressed or not. And crucially, as in B, it could have a, um, a word, a disyllabic word, with the stress pattern that Prince and Kaparsky had noticed before, like glittered. Um, or water in that the weak half of the anapest. Um, but the initial syllable always had to be short. So it had an, a role for syllable quantity was built right into the structure of the anapest here. 
And um, this contrasted with the fact that in the true ANPES, there was no such role for syllable quantity whatsoever. There is in 10A, you have these lines like in the tall waving pines of my own native wildwood with um, stressed, with uh, heavy syllables, and or 10B, for a dark gulf of woe, all my fond hopes entombing. Those kinds of um, uh, weak positions with a monosyllable and more stuff they don't occur in the meters that mix binary and ternary rhythms. So um, this, the, 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 that led, allowed an, an analysis in which what was actually being repeated in the anapests with variable syllable count was um, basically a version of the Moriac trochee that had been proposed. And so it allowed the anapests with variable syllable count to be understood as having a uh, a structure of the kind that Kaparsky's theory expected of being based on iteration of a linguistic um, element. And um, just very quickly, that analysis was able to be extended by, um, by Paul and I to a contrast with iambic meters. Um, uh, the iambic meter in 11 is what we've sort of seen this morning of having a strict syllable count. Uh, there lies a veil in Ida lovelier just um, alternating um, a single syllable in each of the weak and strong positions. Um, but also crucially um, related in 12 to iambic meter with a very, uh, I'm sorry, in 11, I meant to say, is an iambic meter with a variable syllable count. So if you just go down to the middle of that passage and see uh, the lawns and meadow ledges midway down hang rich in flowers and far below them rolls the long brook falling through the cloven ravine in cataract after cataract to the sea. It has the same quantity sensitive um, of availability of a little triple rhythm within the binary, um, basically binary verse. So um, this allowed um, uh, Paul and I to kind of recast the um, typology of English meters, as in 13, um, although you'll see I've actually borrowed the terminology of Fab and Halley using the terms loose and strict anapests, which I think is, is better terms, um, that a poem like Tennyson's Ulysses, it just has a single syllable in every position. Um, uh, Anoni, where the cataract line came from, is loose with variable syllable count. The Voyage of Muldoon, the so-called anapestic poem, is loose with variable syllable count. But all th three of those actually share a binary template. So this left, and this is in a way where I need to start, this left the problem of the true anapestic poems um, sort of unsolved um, in the sense that it was possible to describe the constraints on it in linguistic terms, but the template itself, uh, this sort of ternary template composed of binary parts, was really something that did not seem to um, arise as a basic structure in language. So that problem simply um, remained a bit like Kayuvava. It just was not a problem going away. So um, the basic... Um, first thing I want to do, though I know time is running short, the first thing I want to do is, um, right, is just situate this a little bit in English metrical history. So I said that the true anapestic poems in, in Tennyson were his juvenilia, and he repudiated them, not wanting them published again. Um, but it turns out that they had a very specific lineage that I found interesting. There are basically no anapestic poems that I have found in English um, basically through the first half of the 17th century. They just don't, ex don't exist. The place where they start coming in is when uh, poets start collaborating with musicians. So I've given just in 15 on your handout is one of um, John Dryden's early poems, um, 1687 from A Song for St. Cecilia's Day, which has um, this little passage, the trumpet's now loud clangor excites us to arms with shrill notes of anger and mortal alarms. And 
a beautiful little line, the double, double, double beat of the thundering drum, which um, really can't be assimilated to a poetic structure at all. It's intended to actually be lyrics to, for, for music. So, so th these um, become uh, popular, actually, in the 18th century um, as texts written in a way to instruct uh, composers to compose a triple rhythm. So, um, uh, triple rhythms in music, of course, existed from the get-go, but the lyrics for them in English were written with a binary structure. So they could, a duple meter could be set uh, to a binary rhythm in music or to a triple rhythm in music, but you only started getting poems written in triple meters in English in order to be set to triple rhythms. So um, that um, was sort of this picture with the art, arty things. Um, and the place where um, I want to come to here is that throughout the 18th century, uh, there there came to be an interest in sort of national melodies and lots of books being published that recuperated folk melodies. Um, Thomas Moore's Irish Melodies was the most famous, also Robert Burns's uh, Scottish Melodies. And um, those, of course, included tr uh, triple meters all over the place. Um, I won't go into that. But that is where I want to go back to this poem, The Destruction of, of Sennacherib, because that was composed by Byron in collaboration with a composer named Isaac Nathan. And um, there's Byron, <laughs> dressed in his famous uh, Albanian costume. And the uh, Nathan was an interesting character. He is the first important Jewish composer in England at a time when Jews were utterly disenfranchised in, um, in England. They weren't allowed to go to university. His father was a cantor. And he had ambitions to actually um, not only succeed himself, but actually to recuperate the role of Jews in English culture. And so what he set out to do was to publish uh, the, a selection of Hebrew melodies on the lines of these, um, these um, national melodies, the Irish tunes and the Scottish tunes and so on. Um, and I think there's interesting musicological uh, questions about what he was actually doing, but he collaborated with Byron. So Byron produced um, for his Hebrew melodies, which is almost the only place where he wrote these anapestic meters, like the destruction of the Seneca Reef, for this in collaboration with um, Nathan. And um, I think what I'd like to do just straight away, because I want to be sure I have time for it, is to just play you Nathan's setting, because it's, it's interesting. You'll see it in, in, a, in 20.
I couldn't resist playing the whole thing. It's partly because I'm too nervous to touch the technology to turn it off, but I thought it was interesting. So you can see, first of all, that it's actually set in 2-4 two, two, time, so he's actually um, using something of a beat-splitting way to get the triple effects. Um, but the thing which is actually relevant here is that um, uh, due to a sort of anti-Semitic move or maybe just a proprietary move about uh, Byron, um, Byron's publisher, Murray, did not permit Byron's poems to be published um, with the music as was originally intended. So what actually happened was that Murray uh, published them in a book called Hebrew Melodies, only presented as text. Um, Nathan did publish the music and the, the songs um, independently himself, and they were popular piano pieces um, for um, a, f a few decades. But basically, uh, this triple meter written for music came down to ent entered the English tradition as if it were um, poetry written not to be accompanied by music. And um, that is the tradition that Tennyson picks up on. All of those. Um, uh, poems that were written in the early uh, T Tennyson's Juvenilia echo uh, this set of Hebrew melodies. They all make reference to Psalm 137 that I have the relevant fragment from on your handout in 19, by the rivers of Babylon there we sat down, yea, we wept when we remembered Zion, and so on. And they all, all have a, a theme of uh, someone who is in exile and actually unable to sing because their harp is broken, because they're away from their homeland, even though in Tennyson's poems, sometimes it's because the guy ran off with the, a woman from the king's harem or something like that. Um, so um, that is sort of point one, is that I think that we have an artificial sense of the, the, the role of um, triple meters in English type, uh, typology. Now, just very uh, quickly, I want to say um, this um, leaves the problem of why the discrepancy between um, music and language. So I guess just to say clearly, what I'm claiming here is that there is an artificial triple template for the English anapests. Um, and um, that is different from what 
is generally claimed about music, where triple rhythms in music are just easy as you please from the um, get-go. Somewhere here, I put uh, the definition of laps that you find in uh, Lerdahl and Jackendorf, it's actually back in 14, that um, at every metrical level, strong beats are spaced either two or three beats apart. Um, and uh, uh, when I discussed this issue at a conference celebrating their book, um, Jackendorf said they had actually looked into the possibility of a binary structure and found no evidence for it. So I'm not um, uh, dis uh, disputing that. What I want to say instead is that um, I think there's an interesting reason that I've been pondering as to why music and um, language might differ in the possibility of um, triple rhythms having a kind of primitive structure. The reason I was interested in this topic uh, in the very first place is that um, there's all of this agonizing about the issue in linguistics, but of course in, in dance, a waltz is the simplest, most natural rhythm that you could ask for. And um, every dance that includes a waltz in the tradition of music that might be played from uh, Lubeck to Lubeck, if it has a waltz in it, it will end with a waltz as the simple time when you return to your partner and just relax. And um, I think the issue is that um, a, um, a waltz in, brings balance into the equation. So if you have rhythm which is based on a contrast in prominence, and that contrast is actually um, um, embodied in any way, balance matters. So I'm just going to step aside from the mic so I can waltz for a moment. It's going to be um, right, left, right, right, left, right, left, right, left, right. So the odd thing is always keeping you returning, keeping the two sides even. And every single ballroom dance that's in a binary meter has a way to introduce that. So a cha-cha, um, you hold one and then you will split a beat. Sorry, so one, two, three, cha-cha, one, or a rumba, you'll hold a beat, four and one, two, three, four and one, two, three, and so on. So, and a foxtrot is just a mix of two and one in beautiful ways all over the place. So what I want to suggest is that the, um, the triple rhythms, when balance is involved in rhythm, are the most natural. And that is not the case when um, just a vocalization is involved. There, a duple rhythm is the most natural, and I think there is some evidence in the psychology of rhythm that I don't have time to go into that involves experimenting with infants, um, the role of rhythm in their vestibulary system and auditory systems and how it gets coordinated, that they're happy being bounced to triple rhythms, but they like to hear duple rhythms. So, so, um, so that's just, uh, I think that the vexatious status of triple rhythms in poetry is the correct conclusion. And I just wanted to end by, by saying that I know that they, all of this agony that, uh, about them is not really necessary for, for Fab and Halley, for whom um, taking the model from music and also from the tradition of English poetry, the triple rhythms are a freely available formalization, but I actually think that's a bit like the problem you would have in linguistics if you um, just wanted your typology to allow Kayuvava as freely as any other um, uh, system. Uh, what you want is a result, um, the way Hayes describes Kayuvava, where it's admitted but it's clear that it's marked and you understand why it's marked. So thank you very much. I'm sorry I went on. Um. This, uh, the, the way you were talking about the triple meters at the end, 
sort of resonates with uh, a line that Lairdal has been pushing lately, that poetic meters are really musical meters. Um, not, uh, and so you're applying musical principles to language, and they're really separate, and you're trying to mash them together. Um, and that might account for the presence of triple meters in poetry when they're not present in language that much. I think that it's tr uh, true um, to some extent. What I think is interesting is that there's a huge uh, domain of overlap, but there are also fine points of difference. And so I think, um, for example, I think uh, there are subtle differences in the way syllable quantity is implemented in language that are not really the same that you would get in terms of, say, you know, an even split in, in the timing of music and so on. And so the, the triple rhythms, I think, are just an interesting domain where there is significant overlap, but on the other hand, you see the places where the two systems really are different and po the poetic forms that flourish as poetic forms in their own right really draw on aspects of linguistic structure that in some ways differentiate them from music. So I mostly agree with Lerdahl, but I also think there are these small points of difference which are the interest, uh, particularly interesting. Can, can I do something really quick? <laughs> I had just, I, I, if I have one moment, I had wanted to um, just say, since I'd said that everything ended with a waltz, I am just dying to play um, Isaac Nathan's setting of Byron's most famous lyric, She Walks in Beauty Like the Night, which is a duple poem set to a triple rhythm. So if I can be indulged, I'd love to just end with, a, since I said a dance should end with a waltz, I'd like this today to end with a waltz. Two times. How pure, how dear that was. 
of cloudless climes and starry skies. And on that cheek and o'er that brow so soft, so calm, yet eloquent, the smile that win the tints that close but tell of days in goodness spent, a mind at peace with all below, a heart whose love is innocent. She walks in beauty like the night of cloudless climes and starry I'm sorry, I was... Sir. I thought I was off the hook. I thought I'd used up all the time. One notices that it emphasizes the typical iambic rhythm which Bruce brought to our attention years ago of short, long, short, long, short, long. And this seems to me, therefore, it raises two possibilities. One, that the waltz is really a duple rhythm or that iambic rhythm is really triple. Thank you. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I would say I think that there's lots of evidence about iambic um, uh, meter that it's not, that it is really triple in that sense, that I think it's got built into it, the asymmetries that you would actually expect by, by, by poets' preferences. The waltz being duple, I am actually less sure about. That was, in some sense, the, the point of debate at that uh, conference. And... Um, I know my dance teacher thinks the answer to that is yes, that there's things you would, that there are asymmetries in what you would do in the um, uh, underlying structure there, but you found there was no difference. And I think it comes back to the question of what, what is the body needing to do and that the abstractness is not, um, that the abstract approach is not the um, be all and end all of shaping that question. But in the language, in the poetry, I agree with you about the iambicity. I'm just less sure about the dance. <laughs>